Hello, I'm Lisa Wilson, founder of the John Wilson Fishing Enterprise and also the daughter of the late John Wilson, the famous fisherman. I've been lucky enough to meet many famous anglers um, through my dad over the years and growing up um, there was always something fishing, fishing related happening um, so as you can imagine very exciting times growing up in those surroundings. We've, uh, we've put together a little series of films so that you can find out a little bit more about the people in the fishing world, names that you'll recognise and finding a little bit more about them. So uh, what we'll do is we'll be asking you to get involved as well later on. But to start with, let's have a look at the first video and let's find out what happens when we ask an angler. So the way I got into fishing was really simple to be fair. It was early in the new year and I got grounded so I thought there's nothing for me to do. I came home from school so I just got all this fishing gear out that I'd been given for Christmas that I didn't have a clue what to do with. Got it out in the garden, set the umbrella up, sat under the umbrella and while I was there the rain started to pour. And where I was sat in this tiny little world with all the pitter patter on top of me, um, it transported me into this new world that I didn't even realise existed at the time. Um, and quite frankly that was the minute that I realised I wanted to learn how to fish and through the art of fishing binders which a lot of people watching this won't remember but some of the oldies out there will um, I kind of just taught myself how to fish I remember the first time I ever went fishing I didn't even know what a bay line was didn't know how to cast so I literally tried to cast and backwind the line and the float out and I got into so many messes but those were some in a weird way, those were the best days. Easy question. My favourite way to fish, without a shadow of a doubt, is running a dirty great loafer with a pouch full of maggots down a river for chub. There's nothing in my mind. I mean, I love seeing a barbel bite, the four foot twitch. It's almost like a rock and roll concert on silent, on mute. But And I love hearing the buzzers roar and I love seeing a you know a, just a a cigar float bob under when the pike starts to show interest on the dead bait but there's nothing quite like when you lift into a nice long trot with a big long high sweeping strike and you feel that resistance and you've got the line on your finger and you have you, you sort of just have that fraction of a second moment's panic where you've just got to close that bail arm that is just such a super moment if i could fish for one fish in one way for the rest of my life then it'd be long trotting for chub, 100%. My favourite fishing books, there's two, there's not one, there's two. Um, First Cast by Terry Lampard and Magic Moments by Phil Smith and Steph Horak. I reckon I've read them, and bearing in mind I don't read an awful lot. I've got some books that I've got indoors and they must be 10 years old and I'm desperate to start reading them, but because they're not fishing books, I just can't bring myself around to do it. Um, but I reckon I've read those two books probably ten times between them. They are always in my rucksack when I'm doing a day's fishing on the river, particularly if I know I'm going to be baiting and waiting. And if I need to do something to try to help me with the... The one thing that I always struggle with in fishing is patience. I want it to happen now, you know. Um, and so if I'm baiting and waiting and I need to leave some fish feeding to gain their confidence for an hour, 90 minutes, couple of hours, then I will literally just sit back in a bush in the shade, listen to the surroundings and read a couple of chapters of one of those two books. By far my two favourites. weird or funny well look this is neither this story i'm going to tell you now but it does indicate the dividing line between success and failure particularly when we're on a shoot um fishing all stars season two we went to croatia on our third challenge we was on the river mejnica for some wild carp um we was told there was a few in there but it wasn't certainly going to be prolific and we had 48 hours and on the very first night we put all the rods out and rooney had a take now this take was so brutally savage that he struggled to get the rod out of the rest but when he did he walked backwards did everything right and it done him in a snag in the middle of the river that none of us knew was there and it cut him off just one of those things when you're fishing like wild venues um for the next 36 hours we caught chub but that weren't what we was there for. And catching chub in the middle of the night on a river when you've got to go out on this big, long, yellow banana boat kind of thing that we had at our disposal, didn't have any fishing boats, um, 
was a challenge to get the rigs back out because we needed every single minute to count. And for 36 hours after that lost fish, we saw no signs whatsoever of carp. And we did our homework and we were reportedly to be in the best area at that time of year. So a move really wasn't on the cards. Anyway, within an hour of packing up, I had a take. Now this was, quite frankly, the hardest carp fire I've ever had. I ended up going in the river, just jumping in the river willy-nilly to try and get some side strain on it. Then I got back out, got back into this banana boat, did a loop-de-loop, -loop, went down river, got stuck in a snag, had to handline the carp out of the snag, then got into an epic fight with all three of us, Gary Newman, Adam Rooney, and myself playing a major part. Obviously, I was on the rod. Um, but Gary was in his boat trying to tether me to the branches of a tree to give me stability. At the same time, Rooney was on the bank trying to do the same, holding my boat with one arm and anchoring himself to a dirty great tree with the other arm. And I don't know how, but the hook held and I just gave it everything I had. And eventually the, the, the carp, which ended up being a 36-pound river stunner, um, slipped into the net. Now, the camera's cut. Everyone did their celebratory cries and stuff like that. And the first thing I noticed when I looked into that net was that that carp not only had my rig in its bottom lip, but also had Adam Rooney's lip from 36 hours before in its bottom lip. And that is the dividing line between success and failure on some of these shoots. We was told there was a few carp in the stretch. There was definitely one because we hooked it twice. So I've got two places I want to go and two species that I'd really like to have a go for. One of them I think is extremely accessible and it's one of the reasons why I'm not that worried about it. I'd love to go up to the Fraser River, get on the back of one of them boats and catch one of those dirty great big three, four, five hundred pound plus sturgeon. That just looks spectacular and so does the species. Um, but the way in which they fish from over there is extremely sustainable and so I'm not in any rush to do so. Um, but the one thing I would love to do and it's always been my number one. Now, I don't know why it's above a golden marcia on the carvery, or I don't know why it's above that, but I've always had something about a dirty great big Nile perch. I would desperately love to go to Murchison Falls and lure fish in there for an 85, a 90, or a 100 pound Nile perch. That would be my absolute Everest. And I've done some awesome things. You know, I've been to Suriname and caught Lao Laos to mid hundreds. Um, I've been over to Thailand and had 1,500 pound Siamese carp in a session. In a session, ladies and gents. But I'd swap them all for a 100 pound Nile perch off of Murchison Falls. That place just looks unbelievable. And those fish just have something about them that it just ticks all of my boxes. <laughs> 